Let's start with it at the beginning. Um, how did this project first come your way, and what drew you to it? Um, I am a lot older now, so I, I really can't be relied upon for this to be accurate. But I was, I just started doing some music videos for war films. I'd done a directed one called uh, Fluorescent Adolescent. And so I met the, some of the producers at War Films and they had optioned the novel uh, which Joe Dunthorne had written. And at that stage it hadn't been published yet, but they were someone called Ali Gibbs, um, new Joe Dunthorne. And so they'd read it first, I think. And I think as a result of doing the music video and getting to know one another, um, they thought I might, you know, be in some ways attracted to this book. And the thing I liked most about it, um, I remember was I, I just thought the, there's a specific moment in the book when um, Oliver Tate pushes Zoe Priest, I think it is, um, into the pond. And he said something, worth the effect of this will be one of those glorious moments that you remember. And there's something about that line and just this character who was um, sort of self-consciously playing with being unpleasant that I thought was interesting. So it was really Joe's inhabiting of that, the voice of that character that got me. Yeah, I, I read, I mean, that portion of the of having a discussion about film that is 10 years old, so it's quite a lot of material to draw from. And I'd see an interview where you mentioned that what you liked also about this was that the nature of coming of age films could be the right to put a very positive color. You know, those kind of things. So, yeah, I like that it, it was quite forensic about this uh, delusion and, and, and also the sense of somehow thinking that you can, uh, how to put it, almost steal a march on your future self. Yeah. Uh, by knowing how various uh, narratives pan out, and you know how they've panned out before, you're going to be able to circumvent them. Yeah, I think that's when watching it for the first time, um, I'd watched it before I'd read the book. I think when you come into a coming of age story, you kind of also come at, to those expectations of, as you're saying, like that American reveal, where is this going to pivot and change? And it, where it comes in a way that it happens to is very different to what we've seen before. When the idea to make a, a British coming of age story, how did that feel for you as a filmmaker? Is that something you wanted to explore? And how innately British it was, was that something that also is a, is a big draw? I mean, I can take no credit for anything nativist about it, <laughs> um, in that it just was already Welsh. So <laughs> it felt, well, that's sort of what it is. And so all of the um, setting and that, that tone of the characters in Joe's book, I think, um, I suppose it was more just trying to not get spooked and think that somehow it needed to be American because this is a uniquely American genre or something, um, which I don't think it necessarily has to be at all. No, I, I think it's just, it's one of those part, genres of film that's really quite, there's not very many modern no. British coming of age films, it's typically something from the 60s that we see. Yeah, well I suppose also, I guess the idea of the teenager has been claimed as an American invention, <laughs> and that, you know, the Victorians were interested in children, I mean often, not good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, I'm not so sure. So I remember some of the time saying, oh, have you seen Bronco Bullfrog? Uh, which I hadn't, I just saw it maybe three weeks ago now. And uh, I feel there was a sort of, I, almost like a semi bawdy tradition, a kind of English coming of age thing, which is mainly about some kind of potency race, which just didn't uh, feel like at all. Um, I mean, from the book, as, and that's vaguely the premise that he's trying to sort of lose his virginity, but in, in a certain way, it doesn't seem that important to him. Not like the driver of why we're here for this story, it just happens to be part of the period of time that we're existing with it. Yeah, and I think also he's partially giving himself that as a, an arc, a goal. He 
he's using his influence, the yeah. influence of him of coming of age movies in his own yeah. coming of age. I think it's actually terrible for you know his writing. Yeah. yeah. When using somebody else's, uh, or adapting somebody else's work, where do you find the space to put your imprint on it as a writer or and as a director? So when you were looking at submarine as a, as a as a subject to adapt, where do you feel like I can put my 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 impression in here? Um, well, that concern often doesn't arise because. You you like the book? It's not. I don't know. It just doesn't feel like um, the book is in the way of you at all. Um, you will infect it regardless of your intention. As in, you, there's going to be a problem in that it's going through some other person as soon as it's being made. So it's always going to alter. But I I didn't feel oh the this book is in the way of a personal expression because that will come about whether you like it or not somehow and the the thing that i um like that someone said about uh adaptation was uh, stanley kubrick saying that there's an idea that uh very external descriptions in books that's what makes it easier to adapt but his notion was that if a character and the internal life of characters are well described that you can always think of external incidents that may well illustrate those interior things. And so the, in, the interiority of the book was um, great in terms of feeling, oh, would you do this or would you do that? And it broadly, I think, follows the path of the book. The book has a whole other section where it goes off with Zoe Priest and he joins a drama club and things like that. So. Often, I think with books, it seems to be that you just distill. Yeah, and see, I've got. I did ask for some. We asked for some submissions for questions, which I'll, will be. I've included. I might actually skip over the names just because of it's been a long time since I've done this. A little nervous, I won't lie. Um, so I'm sorry if I forget your name, but that leads on nicely to a question I have here from Darren Darkey. Darren here. There you go. Uh, is there anything from the book that you wanted to include that you couldn't for whatever reason? Um, I, I don't think so, straightforwardly, only because, just like with anything, if it doesn't feel like it fits, then it's good that it's not in it. So it's not that there weren't things in the book that I thought were very successful that aren't in the film. It just, um, it's all... I, I very rarely uh, felt, oh, I should have put more in. Where, especially if you watch something back, you always feel, mm, maybe you could take some more stuff out, generally. <laughs> so, no, but that's not a reflection on, the, on what's in the book and the quality of the book. It's more, it feels good to be as compressed as possible. And as we're seeing here, 10 years after its release, when was the last time you actually watched it all the way through? Ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched it since we finished the, as it was then, the colour timing at Deluxe before it closed. Um, which I can only take partial responsibility for. <laughs> but yes, I haven't seen it since then. And there's been none in this past year with some time on your hands for cheeky watch or I've had the time to see it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just. I can't see the percentage in it for me. Um, yes, I don't know what that would do. Okay, as we were just saying, with that time as much as you have in abundance, you want to use it to explore something else. Yes, I think so, definitely. You don't want to. I've, I've bored people with this before, but I, um, Martin Amos, a long time ago, apparently said that his idea when he was young of a good time was to smoke a joint and reread one of his old novels which to me sounds like the most hellish <laughs> thing you could ever do, uh, in every aspect. <laughs> I feel like that, that's, that your feelings are slightly influenced why we came straight in. I was like, let's just get the EPA started. Yeah, it's, um, it's two songs. <laughs> um, so I would also briefly, before we came in, I mentioned to you about its impact. And I think that's one thing that I always really enjoy when we do these Q and A's of films. Uh, had a, had a time of life of their own post-release. Um, and 
and this one, as I said upstairs, is kind of shocked just by the volume of people not who have taken it to be like their film. And I think that's revealing my age a little. Um, but also it was really nice to see that there is a, there are films of people that are fairly recent, that people have shaped a very key part of their life around. How does it feel to know that you've had a, made a film that has had that life after release and will inherently become a film that will be people's film, their film, forever? Um, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, yes, as in I literally am not, I can't quite believe that is true. Um, so I think I just can't accept it somehow. <laughs> I, I, uh, it's, I'm really uh, grateful for anyone uh, seeing it and spending time with it. Um, I think I used to uh, see things with uh, directors and they're always talking about the last thing um, that they did. And, you know, you'd be going, yeah, but what about the graduate? <laughs> talking about. In the case of Mike Nichols, maybe, I don't know, something that's perhaps not as entirely successful. I think regarding Henry's a good film, but it's not perhaps as successful as The Graduate. But in a way, you, you aren't quite there anymore. And um, so your, your options either uh, to, I just don't know, yeah, there's nothing you can do about it's it just, in a it's certain out way. out of your hands now. It's yeah, and um, I have a great suspicion of, uh, thinking about things you've done i just don't yeah what can you do about it it's mm -hmm. just yeah i i'd said well I'm, I'm pleased if people like it but i obviously am not mature enough to show that graciously <laughs> <laughs> i said when i was introduced this evening that when i reached out to you to say what you want to do you said yes i thought we were cautiously but, but why <laughs> right yes well you know that question still stands up i feel <laughs> but, uh yeah i'm you do hope people see it, but uh, don't uh, presume that they will necessarily. And also, it doesn't quite seem to uh, refer to another uh, person with uh, more cogency than me. I remember Stuart Lee saying something like, uh, the way things are received is a little bit like a weather system, that there, there's a source of correlation between an, uh, in, uh, an initial event, but the end of things got so many other aspects to the drizzle that ends up occurring that you can't totally view it as to do with you, I think. And so, so many things that I think are timing and luck and whatever you might think. And I suppose maybe like a lot of people thinking about uh, films in lockdown, I wondered whether one of the reasons films, people like films of a certain type want to stay with them is that there's something pleasant about being in that world and I think you can sometimes have a film that, say, you might really uh, think is very good or, or extremely well realized. Like, I'd say, um, like Ingmar Bergman's The Silence. I don't know if any, uh, but it's not a world you want to continually occupy. Um, whereas there's something about Wild Strawberries where you go, yeah, I, even though it's quite dark in certain ways, you go, I, I can hang out in that space. I get that, I get that world. I'm yeah, I think that. so, yeah. Yeah, well, that, I think you've definitely touched on that as a world that a lot of people, as I say, I think, you know, really, of all of the stuff we've got on social media, the, just noting that it had been 10 years seemed to shake the earth beneath a lot of people because of that <laughs> period of time, because it was such a good time. It's been out for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big part of it. Um, you mentioned previously about the work you've done with Arctic Monkeys um, prior to work on submarines. I've got another question from an audience member, Sally Caron. Um, she has said, how did Alex Turner become involved in the making of the soundtrack, and was he always your choice to do the music? Um, he was, yes. Um, through meeting him, through doing music videos for Arctic Monkeys, and originally the idea was that he was just going to do potentially covers. Um, uh, I think a Nico song called I'm Not Saying, and then possibly some John Cale um, songs. That was maybe going to be it. Um, and then slowly he just peppered in new songs and then it just felt, okay, he's going to write all new ones. And that was uh, very uh, gratifying. Um, yes, I remember, yes, him, him playing Pile Driver Waltz, I remember, just in the studio, 
it was just a very small studio that he had. Um, I just, yeah, that felt, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> 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 yeah, so that's, um, yeah, that was just very fortunate. Yeah, because I think, as I'm, as I'm saying, I think that that has been like one of the big things that's helped be, it become one of these films that's so important mm. to so many people. Um, that being the sentiment that we shared quite a lot with on online when we had mentioned it's the 10th anniversary, it was the clothing choices that people right. say that if I wore that jacket I had for that okay. hair, I wore those glasses, it was a very okay. repeated sort of sentiment. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the soundtrack, a lot of people are just like, that soundtrack was my introduction to mu almost like music uh, on in, a, in an area that can now be my own, that can push me into an area of music. Right, yes, well, I mean, he, he, he was, his songs were brilliant, and also, um, I always, uh, not felt that it was uh, terrible, but I thought, I felt a tiny bit for Andrew Hewitt, who did the score, because I think his score is brilliant. I mean, it always felt, okay, well, in terms of uh, event here, this is not going to trump Alex in terms of doing songs in this film. So um, I would uh, also, in due diligence, say um, I'm, really grateful to Andrew Hewitt for doing the score and I thought he was, he did a really, I loved his score, he did. Okay, I've got, I'm gonna go back with talking Tom and H films. Mm -hmm. I missed this question from an audience member, Tom Parfit. Hey, hey Tom. Um, so you're just accrediting these questions. <laughs> not all of them, some of them. Okay, way. no, I like that. I the, the, these are, to, these are real questions. The They're not allowed to answer them. Because the spittle will hurl towards yeah, the yeah. yeah. your safety. These extremely directional questions would be asked. Oh, oh, it, was, it was a... This is coming across as more confrontational than I mean it. <laughs> I, I haven't had conversations for so long, I, I never got them right anyway. <laughs> I can't judge a volume, like you're quite far away, so I'm probably speaking louder than I would. So I, I'm sorry for it getting very aggressive. Then. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, apology accepted. Um, so, so Tom has asked, um, what are your favourite coming of age films? Um, well, I think, well, would you call the graduate coming of age film? I think okay. in, in the world of when you see those okay. lists, it's always there. I'd say the graduate. Um, I think the squid and the whale is great. Um, what else? Rushmore. Funny enough, that's playing upstairs right now. It's very cool. Well, you made the wrong choice, then. <laughs> pretty good. Um, what else? Hmm. This isn't Strip Badlands. I'd say it's a coming of age film of a certain kind. I'd say Taxi Driver is almost a coming of age film. I mean, you know, he says in a certain way. It needs to be that period of life. It could be coming of age later. I think it is a slightly delayed coming of age. I'm now going to program a season of this as yeah. a thread of the delayed coming of age. Yeah, I think you could. Um, what else? Oh, 400 blows, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. Oh, Satchel Ray. Yeah. Apu. The, the or, trilogy. Yeah, the Apu trilogy. And then Catherine Breyer. Her stuff, Fat Girl, I don't know what the French title is, that's, I mean, she's incredible. And also there are some films which are more young adult film, which a film director called Bal Barbara Albert, do you know her, Bulgarian? She's really, that would be, no, she's Austrian, I think, maybe, she'd be a good season. She did Free Radicals, and um, did Barbara Albert, is that? No, she's really, <laughs> really amazing, she's I'll really amazing. Mind. Barbara Albert movies. Yeah, I would. Uh, Northern Skies, maybe I said that. Yeah, Northern Skirts is called, cool, but it's no, I can't tell what the titles are. Um, I'm assuming the vast majority of those would be an obvious yes, but a lot of these were films that you've kind of had a, an affinity for before coming to making your own coming of age film. Um, yes, I think, yeah, I think I would have seen all of those beforehand, um, but. Um, it wasn't like I was, before uh, reading the book, it wasn't necessarily something I was looking to do. That, that actually, I really do love American coming-of-age TV. So Dawson's Creek, 
the first two seasons, of course, before Kevin Williamson left. Uh, this is incredible. My So Called Life, which is pretty great. And then it went back when everyone started opening restaurants up, as um, which always happened at the end of season one. That wasn't that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> seeded, uh, they were always opening a restaurant. It was a hot thing at that time. The celebrity chefs became a prominence, and therefore yeah, get restaurants. I wasn't so sure season. about that, but uh, yeah. So yeah, Dawson's Creek. <laughs> Any Dawson's Creek fans in the house? <laughs> it's, it's, it's excellent. <laughs> it's excellent. Um, so we presented the film this evening from 35mm, it was yeah. shot on 35mm, yeah. so um, I know we've been in the past, had, uh, we did the season here with films from film and we yeah. both have a fondness of films we present from film. Um, I've got a technical question from Alan and Ben, there was no surnames given by Alan okay, and Ben, yeah. they're not here, yeah. Alan, Hello, Alan, 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 hey Alan and Ben, uh, between Filminist and the Double, what difference did you notice about the approaches or attitudes to analogue over digital? Thank you. <laughs> yes. It well, by the time of the double, it was more. It it had changed a bit, in that, um, the first screening of uh, this film was in Toronto in the Winter Gardens, and then the only projector in this tiny booth that they had, which has an incredibly steep rate, so everything slightly um, tilted and off screen and when you look at it and go it's slightly tilted they go yeah <laughs> and then there's one bit in the theatre where I just went oh it sounds like there's a half second delay I went yeah that's a that's a place where there's a half second delay and it's just one of those places but at the start it was all film projection and then when we went with the double there was only digital projection there and so that happened in however long with it slightly maybe two or three years there was a big shift so the double we still did on film, which um, in some ways we revise against because it had motion control and the film isn't totally solid in the gate, but I don't think it's particularly a problem really. I mean, I think Dead Ring is, is pretty good in terms of motion control work. Um, so it was more that just, it was, it was more people just saying digital is as good um, and in fact, uh, choose it even if they have the option. Now I'm not so sure that, I think a lot of the people saying that have been given rather large incentives to say that <laughs> by people putting in digital cameras. Because I would assume that the period when you work on music video was still Super 16 or 16. A lot of it was, but even then it was, you know, there's a sense of why are you doing this on film? This is a bit of an affectation. Um, but I've never, the thing with digital, and I, you know, there's been really interesting things done on it, and I particularly like it when it's at the low end of resolution, like Dogma, and those things are interesting in that, um, I was about to say in that revenue, but in that, in that, in that. <laughs> um, those things Very are good. Good. Yeah, um, the first one's scary. <laughs> um, but there's, very rarely any accidents from digital. You know, if something goes wrong with digital, it just uh, it's a line or it doesn't come out. Whereas virtually every accident on film is pleasing. Yeah, yeah I think when we did that season film, you'd said that also the joy of watching 35mm presented is like watching a live performance of a film. Because yeah. if something is to go wrong or to happen, you know that the human being is going to have to rectify that. Yeah. And somebody's care. And each one's slightly different, and there's an artifact that. I mean, it can potentially just feel like an affectation as to, you know, everyone got over CDs, it was fine or whatever. But this, there is something about a print. Like the most exciting uh, thing I saw in a cinema was um, there was a, a thing where you could go um, as part of a festival. I think it was maybe the double was um, in the festival on Ingmar Bergman's island in for all. I mean, it's not his island, but for all intents and purposes, it's his island. Um, and to watch Persona, the, Bergman's print of Persona in Bergman cinema. There's just something so exciting about that um, that, yeah, just can't be replicated. But if it was just the DCP, it would have not had that. Bergman's same. personal DCP was <laughs> also exciting. But yeah, it just isn't the same. Yeah. So thank you for showing it on film as well. No, that's, it is, um, it's one of those things that I, 
whether it matters to many or not, to us it does. And we kind of feel that, um, how many of you were aware that it was going to be on film before you bought your ticket? Oh, interesting. Um, because we, we feel like it'll always make some, it'll convince someone to buy a ticket who may not have, but the yeah. digital will never have that same. Yeah. That's maybe a new restoration and that sort of thing is different. Yeah, those things can be uh, great. And there is something, I mean, there's really good digital projection, but there's some, I don't know. I remember when there was the kind of balcony up here watching Year of the Horse, the Neil Young, Jim Jarmusch documentary, mm -hmm. and it was sort of shaking around, and it was just, there's just something very exciting about it. And yeah, I mean, we've, we've got rid of the shaking around now. I like the shaking around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting that you had said about the screen you are in uh, for the festival and the kinks it had, because that was something we, historically, as I said earlier, I've been here for 13 or so years now, and we used to have a very curved screen down yeah. here, and we'd have filmmakers in, you can see, testing their prison, like, screen's a bit curved, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought it was up a bit like cool, but, yeah. Even when it's bad, it's good. That was the thing, like, even uh, when you see it, you know, it's fine, it's, some, it's a kind of physical object, whereas, whereas the only thing something's created for is the exact replication of a digital mm -hmm. file. If there's no kind of romance in it being wrong. Yeah, I think that was, not to get too film nerdy on you on a, a submarine right. Q&A, yeah, sorry. Very much started it. <laughs> um, that that it always to me feels like your the romance of it is inherently part of what cinema is anyway. So for me to go see a film on a print is mm. almost part of the reason why we're here. Um, and uh, enough about me. Um, so I've got a question from Grace. Do we have Grace here? No. Hi, Grace. Um, sorry for singling those who have asked questions out. I just didn't want to do all these questions. Yeah. Obviously, get the praise for such great questioning, yes. and then um, and then not pass that along. That's not how we do things here. So, Grace, <laughs> thank you for your question. And your question is: If you were to make submarine now, do you think the final product would be different from the original? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine uh, making it now. It's yes, it's so hard to imagine that. Um, I mean, the main thing about it, I felt. Um, in particular was uh, Craig and Yasmin and those uh, two and meeting them and um, I'm sure lots of people here make films and have had the experience of uh, you know casting and, and having people read things out that you have something to do with and the majority of the experience is mortifying and you just go I can't believe any idiot wrote this <laughs> and, and then it's occasionally someone comes along and you go oh it doesn't it sort of sounds like a, a person now and so Really, that happened with Craig and Yasmin, and it was at that point that it felt oh, it could exist. So even imagining myself having to make it now, I would feel as completely unconfident that it could occur until the actors who could kind of revivify it in some ways uh, appeared, and you never quite know if that will happen. And well, I say never. I've only made two films. What the hell do I know? <laughs> well, we'll be back soon enough to do it. Okay, a double show. We'll, we'll see, see that. how it goes. Um, and let's just, I've got, what, what, one minute left, you say? One minute left, okay, we've got three questions left from audience members. Well, one, 20 20 seconds seconds each. 20 seconds, you do quick, quick yeah. answers? Okay, right, Simon Rob, how involved was Ben Stiller as producer on the movie, and was it mm -hmm. this relationship that led to you start starring alongside him as a watch a few years later? Yeah, I think so, yeah, it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Carla Stoika, yeah. um, what do you consider to be your prerequisites as a director? My prerequisites? Yeah. Oh no, her kiss. Alright. Her. Your perks. Oh, perks. Yeah, sorry. my perks, as in like snacks or. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I guess that you are allowed to make decisions to do with the thing that's occurring. <laughs> I think that's quite a big perk. <laughs> okay, and Jesse Williams? Okay, Jesse Williams, okay. who put in there uh, much later, 16 years old. What advice would you give to a passionate young filmmaker keen to have a career in the film industry? A staple Q&A question for us. Thank yes, you. I, um, well, I don't know. First, I would say probably, um, the, the only thing is I try and avoid this mistake, which I uh, m make frequently, which is um, 
not to think you're seeing something that isn't there. So um, I think quite often you are so, uh, you might have it in your head so strongly and you're really keen for it to have worked, but it hasn't. And uh, there's a great deal of humiliation and shame potentially when it hasn't worked. Um, but to be able to step outside of that and go, okay, this needs to be altered. And say maybe that. I think that's a nice point yeah. to end on. Thank you very much so, for coming. It's very kind of you. And thank you for very kindly to your time. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping as we are in a you know a time of a lot of regular rules locations. We do ask if you just give us a moment, we're just gonna exit out through the side and then if you could when you are ready to leave, go out by the back, move to the front, take your rubbish with you, um, and remember to be kind and be courteous to those around you. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you. <laughs>